Hello, welcome to Celluloid Mirror. I'm your hostess, Betty St. Laveau. On this particular show, we talk about film history, film definitions, and then we talk about movies. Uh, today, uh, I have a few lists, um, one in which is my particular favorite, and did I bring it today? Yes, I did, and I might have done this a few shows back, so fortunately, all can't stop me, so you're gonna have to listen to it again, but this list is called why did the black man have to die first again, mommy? And I love this list because years ago, my friend Sarkis Hand, who happens to wear glasses, and I do too watching movies, my friend Sarkis Hand goes, you notice how the guy with the glasses always dies first? And we were watching The Mummy with Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz. And sure enough, the dude with the glasses got it first, right? So, um, I did a check, and actually, guys with glasses get it first, but black guys get it more oftener. So I made up this list, I guess, about six or seven years ago, so we're going to check it out. Um, all right, so the first movie that the black man dies first in is The Skulls. And this is where the dumbass reporter for the college newspaper just has to go in because he knows Joshua Jackson is going to get admitted to the Skulls, yada, yada, yada. This one also saw, uh, stars Paul Walker, and it's a good bee flicker. The next movie that I happen to notice this phenomenon happening is The Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood, Gene Hackman, uh, Richard Harris, and um, Morgan Freeman, okay? And pardon me for laughing, number one, uh, Richard Harris, He's in my I Would Dig Him Up Club. I Would Dig Them Up Club, meaning he's so sexy, sexy I would dig him up. Yeah, I would. So he steals the movie by playing this dude called English Bob. So years ago, my sister Laura and I uh, were, were catching the end of The Unforgiven on TV. We don't know it's the end. And we're watching Morgan Freeman, pardon me again, get whipped to death. Okay, so we're both instantly offended. We're both affronted. Never want to watch the movie again. So it's years later. And my ex-boyfriend, Peter, goes, you got to watch The Unforgiven. I'm like, hell no, I'm never going to watch that. But watching it all the way through h helped, even though, it's to me, the movie's a bit overrated. But um, it's actually Richard Harris's character. You don't see enough English Bob. Uh, Gene Hackman, of course, who will also plays the heavy in uh, Quick and the Dead, he wields the whip and he wields it with finesse. So anyway, that's the second one I checked out. The third movie is Vanishing Point, which is Barry Newman, who played the crooked lawyer in The Limey. Barry Newman was a uh, actor who for a moment had a show called Petroselli, uh, playing a lawyer on NBC. He plays this guy who's driving this car to beat some record. I kind of f forget the plots for a minute. Anyway, Cleve on Little has a big mouth and I think his buddy is the one who gets it. His bodyguard's guarding him while he's giving a blow-by-blow blow account of the race. All right. The next movie is License to Kill, and that's Timothy Dalton. And um, this is actually one of my favorite Bond movies, even though when I first saw it on the big screen, I was so offended and so shocked. I couldn't believe it. It was the most violent one. and It was, um, I think, his second one. So at any rate, his friend Sharky, who's played by this great character actor, I can't remember his name, gets it by the bad guys, all right? Um, Robert Davi plays the bad guy. Robert Davi, Benito de Toro, and Anthony Zerb play the bad guys to make Sharky get it. So at one point, they're hauling the poor guy up, and Bond happens to see it, the whole thing, and he's hanging up, and some dude goes, his name really was Sharky, because they're on a uh, it's a front for a shark expedition type company. So he's the first one to get it. Then we've got Gangs of New York. And this rule is the rule of never be the only one. So at one point, towards the end, the big old riot happens. Um, and it's an anti-war protest, I believe, I think happened in real life uh, in New York City. Anyway, the poor black man gets it. They, he's part of the gang, but he gets separated by his friends and they string him up. I was like, good Lord, but you know, I mean, that's filmmaking or I mean, that's a Sorsese filmmaking. I'm just saying, okay? So then we have Orphan, where CCH Pounder, and I talked about this movie last week. CCH Pounder, I, and my quotes here are, why did you have to visit? So she's the first one from what I remember to get it an orphan, a uh, little girl 
gets her. It's like, bad nun, bad nun. You should have stayed at the orphanage or whatever. Mind your own business. Okay. Next, we've got Green Mile. Michael Clark Duncan. And for some <laughs> reason, I put here why you step in. But I think I put it because um, of the way he was walking to meet his death. I'm thinking that he was the the first one to get executed. I wouldn't have put that down, but again, this list is six years old. I typed it up the uh, day after my birthday, it looks like. Okay, so the next one, it's number eight, we're almost done, is Apocalypse Snail. And it's the young GI, played by Lawrence Fishburne. Now, back then, I think he was Larry Fishburne. He was only, I believe, only something like 14 years old or 15 when he did this movie. I think he lied and he said he was 17, okay? If not, he was 17 and he lied and he said he was 21. He does an excellent, excellent job. I, when, uh, the first time I saw this movie, I happened to own it. I was like, that's Lawrence Fishburne. Now I would, he, Larry no more, it's Lawrence Fishburne, okay? So um, it's, the, it, it's the, the part of the movie where things start to get creepy and awful, all right, for Mr. Martin Sheen there, tracking down Marlon Brando in the jungle acting like a crazy man. Okay, next we've got, this is number nine, They Live. Now, I'm kind of blowing part of the plot here, but I just uh, got this movie uh, via Kellogg Hubbard Library, Interlibrary Loan. So I haven't seen in a while, but yes, um, uh, a lot of people get it in the movie, but the, one of the main characters, he gets it first, okay? I don't really want to blow too much of the movie. It's a great movie, very subversive, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and um, it's my man, um, uh, JC there. Um, John Carpenter directed it, okay? And I think he wrote it too. Oh, no, it's based on a uh, short story called Eight O'Clock in the Morning by an author I can't remember. Last but not least, we have Sudden Impact, which is Clint Eastwood and Sandra Locke and his friend there, another great character actor who has shown up in Clint movies. I put here, don't go in that room, Oscar, because his friend Oscar gets it while Clint's on vacation. He comes to surprise him and the bad guys do him in. All right, so I love this list. Much thanks to Paul Mooney, who is a legendary a uh, comic writer, he wrote jokes for Richard Pryor and many other famous comedians. He himself is right on. Uh, another one of my non-conjugal husbands. I know he's saying she could only wish that I, you know, some preppy Black Panther. She doesn't have enough black movies on her shows to be my, her, my non-conjugal wife, but I love Mr. Paul Mooney. He totally rocks. Check him out on reruns of Chappelle Show. Okay, so. Um, now we're going to go into our three movies today. This volume is called Remember When. Thank you, Mr. David Chase, for kind of helping me out with the title there. Um, Polly Walnuts at one point is reminiscing, and Mr. Uh, Soprano there goes, Remember When is sometimes the lowest common denominator in the conversation. However, when we're reviewing our past or movies that we love, remember when is a key component in what we like and what we don't like. So, as our past makes our present, our present is certainly making our future. So, the 90s, do you remember when? Remember being in your 20s, your 30s? <clears throat> Some of you all in your 40s and 50s, but do you remember the 90s, late 90s? Some of the best movies in Hollywood, best in terms of entertainment value came out and we're going to check out those three. So uh, on with the show. Now, the first one that I would like to discuss is U-Turn by Oliver Stone. This one has everybody in it. It's got Bo Hopkins, Susan Haggerty, Brent Briscoe, Liv Tyler, Lori Metcalf, Nick Nolte, Powers Booth, Sean Penn, Jennifer Lopez, Billy Bob Thornton, Joaquin Phoenix, Claire Danes, um, and last but not least, John Voight. Okay, so this is a, um, it's a tour de force. I got to thinking, could it be classified as noir? And they actually 
classified as noir, and it's set in the Arizona desert. It's about a four or five time loser. Um, Sean play, Penn plays a tennis pro who has very bad luck with gambling, and I think very bad luck in general. So when I first watched this movie back in the day, it was really a face for the senses. Um, I realized that I was born in the Midwest, but I became a Yankee when I was 12, so I'm a Midwestern Yankee. But I'm a Westerner by default because we all thought we were going to live out west first, the family, and then we end up here uh, in Vermont. So the thing is, is that uh, Ma still bought the house out in Arizona years ago. So I have um, feelings for the West, and also I go to a college, a university in the West, college called Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, Arizona. So I love anything about Arizona. So remember when I remember back when. I had no idea I was going to actually have an Arizona ID, which is actually lifetime ID because the politics out there are crazy, and also um, go to college out there. So the big sweeping panoramas and vistas of Arizona presented here are, uh, will warm the cockles of you want to be Westerner's heart. I'm just saying, okay? So, um, yeah, it got a scathing review by Vandy Fair. Um, and uh, this is not a love triangle type of plot, it's a quadrangle. So as our feckless, luckless Bobby, played by, and I think that's his name in the movie, played by Sean Penn, um, his luck goes from bad to worse as he hits Superior, Arizona. And he becomes involved in um, a sort of uh, make some money by killing somebody scheme involving Nick Nolte and J-Lo. Unbeknownst to Bobby, everybody in Superior has their own agenda. He has an agenda. He just wants to fix that beautiful common gear that he's got and get the heck out of town. But this is going to prove to be a little bit tricky. And it doesn't help that Billy Bob Thornton is the loquacious, which is a talkative, uh, mechanic who doesn't do a dang thing to his car. Okay, so the movie might disturb some people, but for others, uh, it was sort of boring because they felt like Mr. Oliver Stone had just pulled out all these bags of tricks that he had done before, but I actually enjoyed the movie quite a bit. Uh, I didn't know that I was in for a, a perverse black comedy. I, I thought, um, ooh, an interesting thriller, and yes, it was quite interesting. So, um, Bobby, as a character, would be likable if he stopped blaming other people for the problems that he has, and Joaquin Phoenix and Claire Dane steal the show as um, a couple of country bumpkins who pester him while he's just trying to get a cup of coffee. You gotta check that out. I think that's one of the funniest thing and the best thing I've ever seen Claire Danes do, is play um, Joaquin Phoenix's uh, girlfriend there. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so this has lots of secrets. It's got lots of jump cuts and dissolves concerning the filmmaking, lots of slow-mo, no slow-mo, flashbacks. Yep, flex with clothes on, I'm going to say it. And actually, J-Lo looks great. This was Jennifer Lopez's finest hour. I actually can't stand calling her J-Lo, but um, she made some extremely... Uh, the movies were really well crafted, the ones that she did back in the 90s. Uh, Out of Sight by Steven Soberg and um, Angel Eyes with Jim Caviezel, which, it, which also had Sonia Braga, which it was such a sleeper to me, but it was actually a very interesting tale. And for sort of a ho-hum, the cop has psychological problems movie, Jennifer Lopez did a great job. So w this is one of my favorite roles of her here in U-Turn. Um, she is very sexy and she's lying. Almost everything that comes out of her mouth is a lie, all right? So part of Remember When is the fact that Nick Nolte and Powers Booth, they're both in this movie. And back in the day when I was a kid, okay, in the 70s, when there were just three networks and uh, that mysterious U UHF thing where you could watch shows like this on, okay, you had Peter Strauss, Robert Urich, Richard Chamberlain, all right, Nick Nolte and Powers Booth, 
And let's not forget David Jansen, who, if he hadn't died prematurely of a heart attack at 50, would have also become a uh, big name Hollywood motion picture movie star. Okay, so these th three guys, wherever you saw, you saw one could see the other, all right? They were in lots and lots of made-for-TV movies. Now, there was a golden age of TV that was G.E. Westinghouse, um, Boris Karloff's show, there was 50s, 50s TV shows which presented actors who would later go on to win Academy Awards, such as Charlton Heston, Eli Wallach, James Coburn, um, Lee Marvin, etc. Actors who were cr honing their craft, whether they were doing um, actors, actors Studio and the other one, I can't remember, sorry, Method, method Acting, Actors Studio and the other one, okay, Stella Adler, all right. Uh, they were honing their craft, and then before they got their big break in Hollywood, they were doing television. So in the 50s, there was incredible, incredible talent. Even Mr. William Shatner, okay, everybody was in television. So then um, there was another era that was just as startling, and that was the era of 70s TV. That was the era of Mr. James Aubrey, who canceled every single show who had a tree on it, unless it was Gunsmoke. Okay, William S. Paley, who ran CBS, loved James Lorness. But that was the only show throughout the 70s that was on the air on CBS that had a tree in it, okay? So under James Aubrey, we had television such as um, uh, the Reiners, Carl Reiner and his son Rob, and uh, Mr. Norman Lear. So we had comedy. But also in the 70s, you had the m movie of the week, which was developed by, I want to say, uh, Aaron Spelling, but it was probably Barry Diller. In the 70s, Mr. Aaron Spelling was it. Charlie's Angels, The Rookies, you name it. He had his hands all over it, okay? And um, the guys who kind of run Hollywood now, or more, Barry Diller and Michael Eisner, they worked under him. So uh, nowadays, if you are a big name movie star, you can get a job on television. It used to be back in the day, if you had been on television, you could possibly make the transition into movies, but hard telling, not knowing. Not a lot of people made it, all right? So um, that is part of Remember When. Now let's go to our second movie, which I believe is Talented Mr. Ripley, all right? So our first movie was made in 97, I think. Pretty sure it was made in 97. 97 or 99. Um, our second movie was made in 1999. It was directed and written by Anthony Magella, uh, written by James Deborn and Jack Davenport, and um, based on a movie, uh, pardon, based on a book by Patricia Highsmith of the same name. And a movie was made in 1960 called Plain Soleil, Purple Noon. Uh, also based on the book, starring Alain Delon. Alain Delon is our famous movie star who once said, no one goes to the movies to watch their plumbers. However, there are a lot of cute plumbers in Vermont, so he had just never been to this particular part of the states, you know. But um, at any rate, uh, he did say that quote. So both versions are awesome, fantastic. Um, it has Matt Damon, the American version. Matt Damon, Jude Law, Gwyneth Patrol, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Kate Blanchett, uh, Philip Baker Hall, I think that's his name, and um, yeah, so uh, we lived in Italy for a while when I was a kid. It is really that beautiful, this movie set in Italy. It is really that beautiful. Um, the parts, and it's, of course, it's, uh, Italy is, is different in the 50s when the movie was set, uh, the book was set, I believe, than it looked in the 70s when I was there as a child. So it looks very different today, and it's still beautiful, but uh, they happen to, where are the notes? They happen to film this movie partly in San Marco, Venice. I've got the sites for it. San Marco, and a couple of other places because Mongibello is a fictional place. So this is the plot. Tom Whip Rip Whipley is down and out on his luck. He is mistaken uh, 
as a classmate of a rich financier's shipbuilder's son. The man sends him to lure his son, played by Jude Law, back to the States so that he can work for his dad, plus his mom is sick. So Jude and his, um, uh, his name's Dickie Greenlee for the movie, and his girlfriend there, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, her name is Marge, are, uh, they take to Tom Ripley, and uh, they're friendly with him, and he comes over and eats with them and drinks martinis, and sooner or later he's enmeshed in his life and he becomes part of them because uh, Tom, uh, you know, he's not what he seems. What I write here, he's deceitful, hungry, greedy, cynical, and a phony, a forger, and a liar. However, his friend Dickie Greenleaf is no better. Uh, Dickie is a rich playboy, and his millionaire status doesn't help him because he's immoral, snobby, um, even though he does like his, uh, he loves his girlfriend Marge. Uh, he's a total bald-faced cat. He's a horrible, horrible, he's really a horrible person, violent. So what ensues, because Tom is a grifter and Dickie is a millionaire playboy spoiled snob, is a tale that involves murder, suicide, deception, deceit, grifting of the worst order, and heartbreak, okay? So um, the time period that it's set in is the 50s and I think that in terms of theme remember when uh, anyone who was a child back in the 50s uh, anywhere in the world can probably remember a simpler more calmer life and I think that our director here Anthony Magella who also wrote the screenplay did a very fine job in translating that time period translating the 50s to the 90s this movie is a joy and a feast for the senses. It's really lovely to look at. Uh, Ms. Paltrow, uh, she's playing herself, which is great. She's perfectly cast for that. Um, uh, my man there, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, steals the show as a brutal preppy named Freddie Miles. We do not see enough of him in the movie. He actually uh, only had about six weeks, I think, to prepare for the part, from what I remember reading. I think I read that in GQ magazine a little bit after the movie came out. And I think he thought it was, uh, one, I think it, it was one of his favorite roles. Um, uh, but don't quote me on that. Okay, so Mr. Damon is a great villain. He also played a piece of dirt in the, uh, what was that one? The Departed, okay? He's really good at villainy because he has like that chunky cheek kind of cuteness, which it's not my type of cute, but Playing a villain, it, it's, it's a good look. Um, Timothy Oliphant has my kind of chiseled beauty, makes me kind of sigh, kind of like that type of jawline. But at any rate, um, check it out. And, and check out the map of Italy and kind of see where they were all hanging out. All right. Now we are, um, oh, so. Uh, this particular movie, let's see if I can find it. I want to quote the statistics on it because I thought it was interesting how... All right, so put very briefly, let's go back to U-Turn for a second. U-Turn was made for $19.9 million and it only grossed $6 million. It wasn't very, it wasn't liked by the critics. It was sort of a bomb. I mean... When you only grow $6 million, it's a bomb, okay? So the movie we're talking about right now, and let me see if I've got the statistics for that, it actually had a fairly good showing at the box office. Okay, that's, yeah, that's all right. We'll, we'll, I'll probably find that, find the notes for that one as I'm finishing up our next movie, which is, a movie I've done many times on the show. It goes under the heading of New York movies, movies about the devil, uh, movies about Keanu Reeves, okay? And this is the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Devil's Advocate, all right? And the reason why I put this movie in here is because, um, oh, here we go. It was, this particular movie was made for 152, no, it was made for $57 million 
and grossed 152 million worldwide, which meant that it was pretty much a hit. Uh, the 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 couple critics who didn't like it, uh, uh, Roger Ebert and Mikiko uh, Kakutani, um, they didn't like the movie, but they've never made a movie for 51 million dollars. So I have to disregard what the, you know what I'm talking about. It's it's kind of hard to read the critics this a movie, and yet they've either never picked up a film camera or have never learned the rudiments and secrets of digital editing. All right, so sorry. So this movie was great. Um, uh, and basically, I put this here because it felt fall, falls in the 90s, but I, I've talked about it so often, so we'll just go over the cast. Uh, Craig T. Nelson, Charlize Theron, Connie Nielsen, Jeffrey Jones, Al Pacino, of course, Keanu, Deloy Lindo, Don King, and Roy Jones playing themselves, and Tamara Tooney, Judith Ivy, Tamara Tooney and Judith Ivory, both soap opera veterans of television. Okay, so um, as we know, Al plays the devil. His name is John Milton in the movie, and that's a homage to John Milton's Paradise Lost which in turn pays homage to Dante Alighieri's Inferno, which is the legend of Faust. Now, I get that all mixed up sometimes, so I had to go really carefully with that. Now, Brad Pitt was going to play uh, Keanu Reeves' uh, character, Kevin Lomax, but they couldn't find a devil. All right, but I don't think anyone wanted to play against Brad. Brad had just, I think around that time, had played Death and Meet Joe Black uh, with Anthony Hopkins. And that movie was a, that movie, what a turkey. They should have saved that for Thanksgiving. It was so awful. So Brad's not a good bet uh, as a star. He's a good bet as a second banana. So the casting went, the casting warms the cockles of me heart, okay? The way everybody just did what they have to, had to do here. So, um, it's based on the book by Andrew Niederman. I really would like to read the book. And Keanu, as a matter of fact, I think, hesitated to do this one because he had just made Chain Reaction with Morgan Freeman, another turkey. That was unwatchable. And it was set in Chicago. It was unwatchable, OK? So um, I'm glad that he decided to do this one. OK, so I think that I have basically, here we go. Here's where, I knew that was going to happen. These are the places where the beautiful, um, talented Mr. Ripley were filmed. Isha and Procida near Naples. That was Mongibello. And San Remo was, uh, uh, San Remo near Rome and San Marco Venice. Sorry about that, everyone. And it was, Produced for $40 million, and it made $128 million at the box office. Jude Law broke a rib in the boat scene, okay? All right. So I think that that's it for me today. This was an overly long show, but we had a lot of material to cover. I'd like to thank Gendron Building for its continued support over the years. I'd also thank St. Laveau Consultations and St. Laveau Lemonade Company. St. Laveau Lemonade made the St. Laveau way for taking time out to be here today, as well as my crew here at Orca, and to my mother, Sharon, Warf Sharon Ardella Warfield, Paris Ochisanya Claridge, for helping me appreciate and articulate my sensibilities about the silver screen. Until next time, babies, stay away from those bad movies. Ciao.